Vinyl Junkies, welcome to the best of Vinyl Me Please 2018. It's been a great year in music with tons of great volume uh, and vinyl as well. So I thought we'd have an episode with our friend Matt Hessler at VMP and Talk Vinyl. What's up, Matt? What's up, what's up? Good to be back. It's been forever, it feels like. I know it's only been a, a couple of months since we got to sit down and talk music, but... Yeah. Uh, it's it's a shame when we let that much time go by. This is like my favorite thing to do is to get to hang out and talk about records. Music. Yeah, actually, you know what? We we met up for the first time in uh, Detroit, right? So it's like we've been yeah. doing shows for a while, but we met up for the first time in Detroit. And this is really because things have been so crazy. You, you went to Vietnam to do dirt biking. You've been all over the place. And... It's the first time that I really get to talk to you and ask you about the records that we bought when we went record shopping together. Oh, I know. Very Herbie specific. Herbie Man, baby. Push, push, right? That's it's like, right. It's all about that Herbie Man. You like it? I love that record. Yeah, it's man. Great. I love it. I've convinced my girlfriend to love it. Like, it, It's one of those records that you put on and you think it's kind of a joke. It's like jazz flute and it's this shirtless guy with his you know, hairy chest, but Big that record chest. is musically actually very cool. I thought so too. I was curious, you know, because that's the fun part about shopping with people, man. It's just, you come across these things and especially when they're cheap gems to just be able to put them into someone's hands and you know that they haven't heard it. And you got this ridiculous album cover. It's like, all right, dude, I'm forcing this record upon you. You got to listen to it. You know, um, if we moved that to VMP, you guys have, um, man, to, it, what is it? It's three years, I think. Three. It's been a good while since we've been working together. And to track the evolution of the way you've done things has been fun. It's been fun to say the least. I guess the question that I would ask is, do you find that you've been able to kind of recreate what we've been talking about, you know, me and you going and kind of like picking this record over another one and that 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 feeling of discovery. I uh, read an article, okay, mm -hmm. that was saying, uh, anyway, one quote was saying that uh, vinyl is not a medium to discover new music by, which I didn't agree with, you know. So I thought I'd ask you, what are you seeing? That's a great question and a thing that, you know, I think everybody hears pretty passionate about right like i i get what they're saying that vinyl vinyl isn't necessarily the place to discover new music because there's the cost associated right like yeah you maybe don't pick up a record like a herbie man or like an aiello mezfin and you know you're not going to take that 25 dollar risk if you might not like it but to those people that would say that i mean i challenge with the other end of that i think because you spent the money, right? It's like if I have a gym membership, I feel like I have to go because I'm paying for it, right? It gets my ass out the door and actually go do something healthy. If I buy the record or if I get it from a subscription like Vinyl Me Please, I paid yeah. the money. It makes me feel compelled to listen to it in a way that I think something like Spotify or Apple Music it's so easy just to push that button and be like, oh, I listened to 20 seconds of this and it didn't grab my interest, so I'm going to click on to the next song. Fuck that. That's not Discovery. Discovery is spending 40 minutes with a record That's and cool. listening to the story that that artist is telling. And maybe if you spend 25 bucks, you feel like you need to listen to it two times or three times. And that's when you fall in love with a record or you start hearing things that you didn't hear in the first song or the first listen. So anybody, I, and I think that's not me having a unique perspective. I think any collector would challenge people that say vinyl is not for discovery. Vinyl's for the discovery of like people that are willing to go a little bit deeper, who like are going to read liner notes and like actually give a shit. Like, yes, yeah, sir. for a yes. lot of the population that just want to hit that next play button, if they don't get that shot of dopamine immediately that they love this song, like... That's not who we're trying to serve. That's not who I think Vinyl Junkies is. Like is. Those are just a different crowd. See, I'm enjoying this conversation. There's one particular element that I'm enjoying about this conversation because, first of all, listen, to watch you be full of piss and vinegar over it, I'm overjoyed by that because you get it. 
Okay. I connect to that. I really do because sometimes I feel completely alone because people talk about it. It's just the music. Okay. I want to tell the reason it is that I disagree with a statement like it's not a medium to discover music is because it's never been that for me. I buy music and like buy, spend money on records I've never heard before on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, uh, the discovery element of it is a huge part of it. That's to say that that's what I'm buying. I am investing in this artifact that for one reason or another looks interesting to me. And yeah. the price is one that I am willing to try. Okay. I understand people that will go out for Spotify and, you know, listen to it first that I get, but I'm showing a record right now that both of us will talk to because it looks like both of us have it on our VMP list. And that's the Ted Lucas record. Um, uh, dude, what is this? Yeah. 1976. I, I, yeah, I, I don't remember. I think he started recording it in 72, but I don't remember when it actually came out. Yeah. It says 75 here, right gotcha. now. The story, I mean, I look at a record like this. Now, the cover caught me right away, okay? The backstory, you can see that it's just one of those records, just one of those things that came out of nowhere that nobody paid attention to, but somebody committed to putting it on vinyl because there's an interesting story to tell. And I didn't know what it was, and I picked it up immediately, and it wound up being one of the more challenging records that you put out that I would say... There ain't a lot of people that knew Ted Lucas before you put it in the store. So anybody who bought a Ted Lucas record, let's face it, yeah. they didn't know who he was, right? So that discovery thing is, I don't know. Well, I'm and, happy and to spend. I'm happy to spend that twenty five dollars you talk about to enjoy the experience of going in completely like a book, dude. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You buy the book, you buy the fucking cover. Okay, this cover looks good. Yeah, and you open it and you discover the whole thing. To me, that's a huge part of vinyl, you know, the discovery part. And, you know, for Vinyl Me Please, I would say that's, at least in, in 2018 especially, the things that I am most proud of are, one, you know, getting our production, like, supply chain kind of figured out in a way that we can produce really hopefully consistently high quality records. It, you know, it's taken us five years as we built this business uh, to, to figure out those relationships. I think the packages are better than they've ever been. Uh, it's that. And and then it's that we've like established this trust and, and, you know, I can't take credit for it. It's a, it's an amazing community of members. It's solid curators on our side, but that people would take a risk on a Ted Lucas, an Adrian Lanker, uh, you know, Ayelu Mezfin, like it, it, we've uh, hopefully established that trust and that people know that it's, it's authentic. It's not because we have some magic algorithm or some tech way of, of saying that like, this is a, a qualitatively good record. Yeah. We're still doing it for the passion and, you know, pursuing things that, that we, genuinely like and believe in and think that like we ourselves would still want to listen to in 10 years not just whatever's like the new the new hot shit the trend the it's not all trap music around here or whatever we can appreciate that stuff but we try to work with records that we think will will stand up it's funny because uh i mean obviously we spoke before actually just turning the camera on but one of the things actually two of the things that i would point to as being actually there's three things that to me stand out in terms of musically um curation is one thing that was a huge deal for me because i discovered some great stuff through you and um you're putting out like your curation of jazz and your curation of world music has gone up astronomically Okay, and I think the example, when we're talking about the vinyl thing, okay, well, from from the world music thing, it's mostly because this stuff is just not available. So it's the first time for us to discover it. For me, the idea of buying this music from another world 
and seeing how it is that it plays into my universe is something that I'll always drop money on. You know, I've bought tons of stuff without knowing it because I knew that it would tell an interesting story that's different than mine. So from an audio perspective, you're traveling. It's a travel guide. I love that. What were what were some VMP picks that like were good world music for you? Well, look, the Ayalu I think was a slam dunk. For me, the Ayalu um, is not something that, I mean, the record didn't exist before. Okay, so you guys were very directly involved with making this music available. Okay, so I found the backstory fun. It was obvious that you were emotionally invested in it. And um, that's really what I know that I buy as a world music consumer. I, I've liked this stuff since forever. And every time I buy world music, very often I have no fucking clue what I'm buying. Okay. Yeah. So I'm comfortable not knowing who Ayalu Mesfin is, but the fact that you guys made this tape into vinyl, put the resources into it, uh, that speaks to me. Okay. And that story is obviously one that's probably going to go down in VMP history, you know, because that's something that you created. A Night in the Opera was there way before you ever laid hands on it. But Ayalu Mesfin, that's you. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, it's uh, one of one of the highlights of, of my career here. I think it's a, something we're really proud of as a company. I mean, I think the music is... It's beautiful. It's funny to talk about Aiello right after Ted Lucas because I'm like, oh, Ted Lucas had this great story where, you know, he was a studio musician and he really wanted, he was like kind of disgusted with fame. And so he recorded this in his attic and he self distributed like the first couple hundred records of this. And he really wanted it to be a project just about the music. He wasn't going to get famous from it, whatever. It didn't work with a label. That's, that's an interesting story and that drew me into Ted Lucas but like what you just said about it being a travel guide when you look at that which is a somewhat American story yes versus Aiello who Aiello is recording this music in opposition to you know a government that took over his country and he was arrested for it and he knew he was going to be arrested and they you know asking him in person like getting to to see this with him now as an old man you know what well, why did you do that and he's like you you have to that's your responsibility as a musician if you're lucky enough to have people care about your music then it should have a message and i mean his message got him put in jail and the only way he could get out of jail was to 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 promise the government that he and his family would leave the country leave their home yeah. And, and so he hasn't been back. And, and that kind of sacrifice, it's a whole nother level. And it's, it's a level of story that, that is so human. And, and I, to your point about discovering music, like discovering music is discovering those stories and who wouldn't want to discover that through vinyl, right? Like that's not gonna, it's not a story you hear cause it comes up on your Spotify playlist. No, that's, it's, you, you're spot on with that. It's funny because as you were telling all of this story, one thing that you'll hear a lot uh, around, you know, Africa and all of these countries that have really suffered a lot of strife, you'll see that these people have gone through great lengths and, you know, have had their lives threatened. They've been thrown in jail. Any of the greats and even the ones that aren't known. OK, so obviously we can point to Fela Kuti. OK, but sure. I'm thinking about people like Eric and uh, not Eric. Uh, yeah, actually, Eric and Korai was also uh, experienced the same thing out of uh, Turkey or, uh, you know, there's a whole host of them that just couldn't play their music and they had to leave in order to do that. There's one. Uh, are you familiar at all with uh, Tenarowim? No, I don't think I am. Or Bombino Tanaroin is basically just a group of musicians that, you know, it's desert music. It's it, And it's the same type of thing. It's politics that really brought it together and politics that drove the music, but only decades after the fact. What they would do, these guys, is they would make tapes for anyone that would give them a blank tape. Only decades after the fact it came hmm. out. And this music is now... 
you know, Bombino, people know who he is, you know, Tanarwin yeah. have played, uh, you know, Coachella, both of them have. So those stories are something that we see a lot more prevalent than maybe we take for granted because we live in a country where we don't have any of that happening. You know what I'm saying? It's a different narrative. Yeah, and, and in some ways that that's like kind of shame on us. And I'll speak as an American and, you know, as a Canadian, you've got a little different situation, but like there's plenty of reason to be pissed off and disenfranchised by what's going on in the world. And it's a little bit sad that so much of what's happening in music is, is still pretty like banal. I mean, why aren't people bringing that energy to try to create social change? And instead it's like, I don't know, there's a very American thing about everybody's just kind of out for themselves and maybe not willing to, to tackle some of that stuff. But I hope in 2019, we see that like music energy, you know, focused on telling the story of, of right now. And, and maybe those stories are different than what you would get from Turkey or Africa or whatever. But uh, I would, I, I don't know. I feel like I connect with, with music that, that has more of that perspective. And actually yeah, that was too. like a couple of, couple of my other picks of things that we got to work on this year. Like I thought Mitski's record, Be the Cowboy, okay. Okay. was a really interesting version of that. It's still like totally digestible and musically like, it's not a pissed off record, but it's sophisticated. Like you think of her perspective and, and I was lucky enough to see her um, around when she put out Puberty 2, it was at South by Southwest in 2016. And uh, honestly, in that record or in, in her live performances around that record, she was actually more like had this like almost punk feel. She's this petite Asian woman and she's on the stage and she is screaming at you at, in some parts and you just feel that energy and Be the Cowboy doesn't have that sound. But it's this sophisticated thing of like that whole cowboy metaphor is the like kind of cocksure swagger of like old white men and she's like why can't i have that as an asian woman like i want that kind of confidence i'm gonna make the kind of record i want i'm gonna talk about hmm. the issues i want to talk about and i don't give a shit and because that's what a cowboy would do that's what a that's what that's that white male privilege and and ego and swagger where we're like we feel entitled to be able to you know tell whatever story we want to tell and and certain people yeah. you know whatever their backgrounds, maybe don't feel empowered to do that. And I love that she fucking grabbed that energy and was like, I'm going to make the record I want to make. I'm going to be the cowboy in this story. It's funny. because I think that's awesome. I didn't see the context. By the way, uh, lower your volume on, uh, I can hear your volume on the on the speaker here. But uh, I didn't see that perspective because Mitski is a record that completely passed my radar. Okay, And I listened to it and I still don't get it. But the thing is, is that, you know, we were talking about how you have to be committed and passionate in order to really get into it. So it's not through the fault of the music. And that's something that John Peel used to say, you know, if you don't like something, it's not the music. It's just you haven't gotten there yet. The connection hasn't been made, you know. So sometimes sure. those types of things, it's like, as you were saying this, it kind of like leapfrogs into one record that really did it for me. And it seems like every year you come up with one record that um, just... I'm not supposed to like, in this case, you did it twice, but a record that I'm not supposed to like, or I'm predisposed to not really caring about and would never listen to unless vinyl me, please put it across my path. Right. And, uh, that's Carolyn Rose, man. Uh, yeah. I didn't know who this woman was and, um, I'm pretty fucking obsessed with her. She's amazing. And what it is that. The, the, I'm showing the album cover right now, and I think it pretty much says the entire thing. She just looks completely disaffected, and it came with this big poster where she looks like a fucking ho hum, uh, you know, uh, cheerleader as they're fixing up her hair in a real mess, and she's got a cigarette dangling from her mouth, and she's got this swagger that comes off really bad in most cases unless you have 
it. And she yep. has it because she's got so much attitude in her songs and there's a humor to it and there's a ballsiness to it. And the one that always comes into my head is dance. I don't even know what the name is the song is, but you know, and put on this bikini and dance, dance, dance. And what she's doing is she's singing about um what people's expectations are you know hey we're gonna send you to japan and we're gonna send you everywhere all you gotta do is put on this bikini and dance and she makes this really crazy playful it's the most sing-along song on the record and then you listen it's like put on your bikini and dance 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 and like my daughter knows the fucking song you know she doesn't understand That's the awesome. context maybe but to the point where i actually follow her on Twitter, and I don't follow anybody on Twitter, but I follow her because there was just one thing that caught me immediately was at one point she just said, you know, it's funny, people think that you're fucking famous and all of this, and they don't realize exactly how broke you were. And for me, that took that personality even further. There's there's a fucking realness to it. I can't tell you what it is, but that record was so catchy. That's okay? great. But it wasn't just the catchy, dude. It's the attitude is one that I buy. That listen, what it's just it's fucking perfect. It makes me think of people like Blondie. It makes me think of people like fucking uh you know, Patty Smith isn't fair because that's too angry, but Blondie yeah. or anybody that really just took control and did something a little different. Madonna doesn't really fit because Madonna, you know, she played the system. Uh yeah. People like, you know, these indie people that just go out and carve their own path is something really cool. And I think that's a difficult thing to do as a singer-songwriter. And for her to do it with as much verve and just attitude, like, fuck, man, you got attitude on you, you know? I look forward to her next record. Yeah, and they are they are still that, like, quintessential indie band, man. They Like, they're driving around in a van and they're doing gig after gig after gig. And they bring and they like the fact that they have that authentic energy night after night. And I think they're they're really into what they're doing right now, which is uh, just this beautiful thing. Uh, you know, they realize that they've got some momentum and, and they've got a fan base now, but they're not nearly at some like level of fame where it, it goes to their heads they're, like incredibly humble funny real like i i i think they're a cool band of champion and i'm really excited like I, in a hundred years when we we're thinking what would be our year-end list i would not have guessed that this record would have been like had that place for you oh yeah well look the thing is is that last year and the thing if look we're putting it in context of vmp obviously but last year the record was the uh daniele lupi milano yeah for me anything that reeks of pitchfork Okay, which is why maybe Mits Mitski hasn't gotten to me. That's one thing that you guys do, and I understand it's but but it's not me. That's not the part of VMP that speaks to me. For me, ugh, fuck the world music speaks to me like big time. Uh your sure. your rap is you're filling some great holes there. The jazz I know that we're going completely off topic, man. Oh my god, you know what? Why don't I leave the floor to you? Yeah, so for people who don't know, you know, we've got our kind of main subscription, which is the essentials thing, and that's where you're going to see stuff that's all over the board, from TV on the radio to Yellow Mezfin to you know Mitski. That was on our essentials, but we, you know, this year is our first year with a rap and hip hop subscription and a classic subscription. I'd be curious for you, like, what what was your favorite um, classics? Because I, I feel like you've got. 10 miles more depth than I do on like jazz blues and soul. And so I'm really curious, like what out of some of those records really like struck a chord with you? Well, look, the thing that worked most for me is you, uh, fit a niche. Now the classics section and a lot of the stuff that you uh, do jazz wise as like a jazz aficionado that really likes to go deep. Um, I'm not one of those guys that's willing to spend $100 on a Blue Note original. I'm not that guy, okay? 
I'll buy the blue notes and because I really like the jackets. I like the entire experience. I don't want the cheap stuff. I don't want Scorpios. I don't want any of that garbage. Okay. The 80s stuff tends to be a bit flimsy. I'll take it, you know, but the thing is, is all that to say that there's a whole lot of catalog there that I don't have. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't want to buy the cheap stuff. But I don't want to spend a fortune on the audiophile stuff, okay? So there's the Blue Note catalog that you treat like that, and then you treat, like, my favorite catalog of all music, the Impulse catalog like that. You've put out some Impulse Ooh, yeah. records, and we were just talking. It's actually showing the ad right now on our broadcast, and right in the middle is Alice Coltrane, Journey and Sacha Dananda. Okay, there's a three pack that we're gonna have on sale, you know, with Max Roach percussion bittersweet and Archie Shep Attica Blues. Now those three records, the I point to the Alice Coltrane to make my point, the Alice Coltrane and the Max Roach, but the Alice Coltrane more specifically. I was surprised to see that I didn't own that record. Okay, yeah. so when it is that it was time to come out, I had told you you don't have to send it, I already have it. Because I just assumed that I had that record. It's something that I've had in every iteration, right? Yeah. So when it came to building my vinyl collection, it was one of those things that I took for granted. But then I realized that's not the reason necessarily that I was doing it. The reason I didn't buy it, because there were many opportunities for me to buy this impulse record. And, you know, very argu arguably speaking, a lot of Alice Coltrane fans will say, Journey and Sacha Dananda might be the big one. You know, Pharaoh Sanders is on it. There's a, it's a huge album and I didn't own it. Why? Yeah. Because a lot of the stuff that comes out on Impulse Records is really poorly done. The jackets are cheap. The vinyl's not pressed right. So I feel bummed out. Okay, I'll pay less for it, but I feel bummed out because the entire concept of impulse records was that you paid like even back then the records cost a dollar more than regular records but they came with the gatefold and they came with the album experience the album experience was absolutely crucial okay and you can get it for cheaper but what's coming out for cheaper doesn't capture that you guys you know and then of course you have the uh audio file stuff that costs a fortune right you guys have captured a sweet spot for me you've captured a place where you're releasing classic records from my favorite catalogs and there's a level of quality that I trust. I know the jacket's going to be good. I'm completely obsessed with that little booklet that comes with the classics. You know, the little booklet of notes. That's the yep. best. That is the absolute best thing vinyl junk, uh, vinyl me please have ever done. I, nice. that, that makes me so happy because it, for such like a thing that looks so little and is included in the package, we bust our asses on those and like commission these huge writers. And to me, they make those records so much better, especially since I have such a, a limited experience with like jazz and blues. Like those stories are what make those records yes. really important for me. If it's done right. The thing is, is if it's done right, because... <sighs> It's got to come off as authentic. It's got to come off well-written. There's, It's such a touchy thing, and you have only so many pages. I really like that booklet because, number one, it's something you can hold in one hand. Okay, mm -hmm. so you have a coffee in one hand, that in the other hand. You can have the... So it adds, and the font is perfect to read. It's easy to read, and it just added another analog or another part of the sensual experience, and it provided some... Um, background that's provided some history that takes the record from when it was released let's say in the early 70s to now uh honestly there aren't a lot of records that i look crazy forward to getting uh but the classic section if you get the thing right it's that booklet that makes that really just keep do me a favor just keep putting out that blue note and that impulse stuff i want it all day long we'll do our best i mean those are those are great sources for us to to tap into so uh, i don't see any signs of that slowing down did you uh, is that like a um, the, is the classics something that you get into like i mean what part of that is it that really spoke to you most out of your picks i mean so i would say for both like classics and 
world stuff. The the thing that's been a big deal for me is just it, it's entry points. You know, I I very good come yeah. to this job with a lot of humility. Everyone I work with, I feel like knows more about music than I do, or they certainly know more about some specific genres, whether it's Storf and country or Paul who runs our customer support and his knowledge of metal or whatever it is. Like I've got my perspective on things that were important to me, but like for classics, uh, like I look at it as a like education curriculum. I'm the same way. Every time I get that record, like equal parts of the package. I'm not going to put it on the turntable if I can't make the time to sit there and read the book at the right. same time. Cause like that is such a big part of the experience. So for me, like my favorite classics record this year was that the Daryl Banks here to stay. Sure. And I think it was probably a smaller record for a lot of like jazz and soul blues, like kind of heads. I don't know that it's like a, Oh my God, all time. Great. But it was two things. One, it's got a, a very Motown feel that reminds me a lot of the music I grew up listening to on vinyl because my dad spent a lot of time in Detroit and was a huge Motown fan. So like it immediately hit me with like just nostalgic vibes and feelings. But then the story about, you know, he got he got gunned down by a Detroit cop not long after releasing this record. This was the only record he put out. And it's, I mean, it's a crazy story. It was uh, not in it, like, cr like specifically racially motivated. There was like a weird love triangle. And I think he was sleeping with this cop's wife. Yeah. And, um, but it, the cop never stood trial for it. There's so many things that echoed, some of the shit we see in society today that, you know, it's 50 years later, 40 years later, 50 years later, and things haven't changed that much. And they certainly haven't changed enough. Um, and, and to me, it was like a really interesting bridging of that gap of like something 50 years old can be still so incredibly relevant, both the story and then the music to me is just, it's, it's really listenable and fun and like, I don't know. Sometimes I don't get on any sort of like musical high horse of like uh, how important it is. I just know when I'm scratching my head and I'm like, what should I listen to right now? It's a easy record for me to turn to. And I'm just like, I like it. Just, I like how it makes me feel. And I immediately like drop that needle and I'm in a good place. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that you're capturing that really well. I think that the, that Stax catalog, it's been interesting how it is that you've been delving into it. Daryl Banks is a Stax catalog, right? Yep. Yeah, it's uh, because you're pulling out titles that I wouldn't have thought of at all. And it's cool because, you know, more often than not, they're titles that I just don't see. Like, I've never seen Knock on Wood anywhere. Right. You know, it'll be cool to get that kind of thing. But I want to get back to that book. I'm, I'm obsessed with the book. Okay, I want to go over that experience with you. I wish I had thought about bringing the record, but what I did when I saw that, uh, what what was it that you sent in there? I think you sent a um, jazz record. Mm -hmm. Fuck, I don't remember which one it was, but I wanted to make sure that I was going to do it properly, so I didn't want to rush through it. I want that moment that's been described by Henry Rollins and it's actually been described uh, on Gil Scott Heron's last record, I'm new here, right before he died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? The moment of no interruptions. Nothing interrupts this. This has to be done perfectly. And I started micromanaging every part of my environment. I wanted to make sure that the coffee was only so far away. I wanted to make sure that the ashtray was only so far away. The liner notes, and I wanted to be in my favorite chair and make sure that it was completely uninterrupted. I turned off the screen because um, I knew that that's the way the music, that, that that's the experience, right? And I knew that the booklet, I now have enough experience. Now I remember which one it was. It was Max Roach Percussion Bittersweet. I pulled out some older stuff, right? A nice. And I've had that for a while, but I, I knew by this time, it was the first time that I became cognizant of what that book represented it 
to my ritual. So it was the first time that I really made sure that I heeded the words of Henry Rollins and Gil Scott Heron and took all distractions out of the way so that I can listen to it properly. And um, the book put me there, man. So please That's don't awesome. stop that book, man. It's really that good. That's great to hear. And, you know, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, where where we can play a small part in that in that moment in the like the the that's our everyone's peak listening right if you took the time to put the ashtray in the right place and to have the drink poured and whatever i think it's our responsibility whatever we can do to make that moment as as high as it can be like that's what we all want as music fans right is to have those moments and i think most people would say like the the peak peak is is probably going to see a live concert. Sure. Uh, for me, after that, it's probably sharing a record that I absolutely love with someone who hasn't heard it and and watching them kind of fall for it and, and, and really enjoy it. I love that act of sharing. And then like the third highest moment is what well, you just described like that that perfect solo listening experience where I've like been super intentional and I'm like, I'm just here to listen to this record. Uh, There's look, I talk about the vinyl experience. Okay. And it's something I'm going to be talking a lot about in the new year because uh, I want the programming to be very vinyl focused because it's not music. It's vinyl. You're selling vinyl. We are, and we are buying vinyl, but it's not just a physical product. We're buying an experience. We're buying a connection. Okay. And um, so now, you know, as much as Pitchfork talks about, you know, whatever their score is and they score the music, I think that I score the experience more than everything else. And I take everything into consideration. The music being just one thing, but knowing that the music, for me at least, it, it's just, it, it's an entirely subjective thing. But there are some things that we can point to. We can point to a good, well recorded and well pressed slab. We can point to a nice album jacket, nice liner notes that take you there you understand yeah. that you don't listen to while washing the dishes or something like that they really put you in the moment and allow you to truly appreciate the art the way it's supposed to okay which is as anti-spotify as possible now as we go on and technology takes us further than that there are things that bring us back you understand mm -hmm. And for me, anything that does that, vinyl is obviously one of that. But anybody that understands that and understands the art of the liner note and makes and, and just added an extra point of quality, an extra quality ingredient to my experience, it tells me you're on to something. It tells me that you act, you're not selling me stuff, that you actually yeah. get it. Well, I appreciate that, man. Uh, I mean, we we we're we're right on the same page there. I think that's why these like conversations are always so fun. That's why I think the vinyl junkies community and the vinyl me please community are the same community. They're oh, yes. people that that care about what you and I are just talking about. They care about that experience, and it's not it's not about rating the music. It's the music, it's the story, it's the package, it's the moment, it's the ability yes. to share it with somebody. It's it's all of that shit. Yeah. It's the and thing I think that... that to just make it about a song or like to give something track of the week or whatever, like you're not talking about the art, you're making music into a bit more of a commodity. Yeah. The thing is, is that uh, it takes a commitment to actually press it on vinyl and sometimes you know what let's i've been meaning to ask you this question so i'm gonna go a little bit left but i really want to know a little bit of the story behind it i'm showing a frank sinatra record okay you put this 10 inch out and it wasn't a cheap 10 inch either okay no but it was th super expensive for a 10 inch but this year this year marked i think the 80th anniversary of the lp and you put out uh what's it called Fra uh, frank sinatra's very very first 10 inch uh, called the voice of frank sinatra i just did a show on sinatra part one i think i did a couple of weeks ago and people liked it i'm going to be doing a part two but uh of all the sinatra to pick out i couldn't believe 
that a company like uh, Vien like I'm just trying to figure out. I was astounded. Okay, I was astounded because this uh, period of Frank Sinatra is not a very popular period of Frank Sinatra. It's one that aged less well and didn't really fit the classics pantheon. Okay, so when he moves yeah. on to Capital and he moves on to Reprise, that's when it is that you start hearing all the songs that you hear in all the Scorsese movies, and that's the stuff. This early stuff is, look, man, he might have been the first teen idol ever. You know, what made you True. guys choose it? It seems like such a strange choice. Kudos for doing it. Yeah, and it it wasn't my pick, so I'm gonna try to speak to it in in the parts that I know. There's I'm sure more story there than than what I can provide off the cuff. But I think for us it was a little bit about how historic this record was to the whole medium of vinyl. Like this is considered one of like the first uh, records, you know. It, he he's such a big artist to have something that was this early. I think we liked that it was a, a 10 inch. The reproduction of it was was done in Perfect. a very classic way. Like for a, a expensive 10 inch, it doesn't actually sound that great, which I don't know. Maybe that's shitty for me to say, but no, like, it's the source material, dude. It's because they didn't rework the source material. They, they this is a this is an item that's really about its historical importance, and, and you take that history with with the surface noise, right? That that's a part of the deal, and, and to everything we just said about the experience, like if you understand the context of this record, it sounds the way it's supposed to sound. It doesn't, which isn't perfect. And I can tell you also that it looks the way it's supposed to look because the jacket is very much an authentic reproduction of the original. Okay, so if you take a look, I do have the jacket in my hand. It's kind of like French style type of thing with the foldovers on the side. And it comes with an extra booklet that you guys put in to kind of like fill in the details. You know, I mean, what was recorded? We recorded during the 30s type of thing, 40s with yeah. Alex Stordahl Orchestra. And... Um, I just found it interesting that you put it out, and of course, for me, kudos, but you wouldn't expect, uh, it seems like a ballsy move, and I'm really glad you sold out of it, it seems apparently, right? Yeah, yeah, it it it, awesome. didn't, it wasn't the kind of thing that sold out in 24 hours or something, but I think we sold out of it in a, in a month, and we did a, we did a decent volume, I think a thousand of them. Okay, so tell me. Which record did you sell the most of? Uh, so non-subscription thing that we sold the most of. That's a good question. I would bet it was, it might have been something like uh, that Bossa Nova Bacchanal. Yeah. Uh, we, we did that series yeah, and, yeah. and all of those we did 2,000 units of. And I mean, they all took a little while to to sell out. I mean, the stuff that sells out the quickest is usually a little more limited. Like one of my favorite records of the year was that uh, Idols record, that kind of punk record, Joy is an Act of Resistance. I think we only did 300 units of that and it sold out, you know, first couple hours. Um, there's some stuff that you know, because maybe it's a little more niche, we do a little lower volume. Those things sell out the quickest, but selling out the most, there was probably three or four records this year that we did a, a 2000 unit run. Um, Death Heaven was one of them, right? Yeah. De well, Death Heaven, I think was, I think we did 750. Okay. And I think that was perfect. It was a, uh, small enough, we knew there was going to be a lot of other variants out there. Every metal record seems to get 10 variants these days. So yeah. we didn't want to be just another Me Too, but I, we've had a long history with Deaf Heaven. We did an exclusive for Sunbather. We did a exclusive for, what is it, Dimension, New Dimensions, the, whatever the record was after Sunbather. And so we just, we, lo we love that band. We've got history there. So we were going to do a variant, but we didn't do... 2000 of them because we knew there was going to be other stuff out there in the market. Um, uh, but man, I love that record. Yeah. For me, uh, I mean, it's funny cause the ones that, 
the two records that came out on my best of 2018 there's a few but the ones that are popping out that i'm looking at right now that are like not just best of vmp but for me best of 2018 simply actually the carolyn rose is one of them for me definitely okay but two of them uh that you guys didn't do a lot of runs so i figured they must have you got you must have run out immediately on them but orchestra akokan from yeah. daptone just fucking cuban fire fire man that thing was on all summer long and then yeah. um look my favorite country record in i can't say how long but colter wall songs of the plains is a, a guy that young should not sound that old and wise it's just actually you're familiar right you're familiar with uh, your doppelganger uh rob mashad from stoughton printing yes right basically he looks like you with a long beard this dude i mean he's got to be crazy to say it but he's he, his statement i remember because it stuck out he said that he would give up all his johnny cash records if he had to just to listen to coulter wall and this is before i had heard a note of this that like i heard nothing bold yeah right I, I Coulter, that Songs of the Plain was also on my year-end best list. I I love what's happening in country. I think it's really funny because if you'd asked me 20 years ago what I thought about country music, I mean, I would have been that punk rock kid that oh, yeah. was like, fuck you, fuck country, whatever. And as I've gotten older, you know, I started to appreciate some of the, the older country, Hank and Willie and whatever. But then in like the last few years, I mean, it probably started with Sturgill. Yeah. And I, I liked some of the early Sturgill stuff. And then I think Sturgill took a turn and it's not bad, but he, he did some things that were really big production and yeah. took away. I like when I want to listen to country, it's because I like the simple song structure right. and like kind of guy in a guitar vibe. And uh, I think Coulter absolutely like last year for me it was chris stapleton this year sure. I, mean, I like the cody jinx record but i think coulter uh songs of the plains is, is an awesome record will be you know considered part of like the real country the revival Pantheon. i i agree uh it's funny because you were mentioning the cody jinx and i liked that one i mean i did pull it but the Cody Jinx just seems to have a little bit more of that sheen that yeah. turned turned me off to 90s. You know, when they used to call people like, uh, what's that singer? That don't impress me. They used to call her country. Oh, uh, the really like pretty Cheryl girl. Crow? No, 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 no. Not that sure. don't impress me. That, uh, that, 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 that girl who was married to the guy from Sony, Canadian. Yes. You know what I mean? No, I know who you're talking da, about. Da, 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 da. I can see her face. Yeah. She she was basically the um, Taylor Swift of twenty years ago, and right. it's the basic, the same basic sheen on that music. Just Taylor Swift doesn't go countrified, then she went countrified. People that are gonna watch this are all gonna say, "You dummies!" This is the name of the person, but I can't remember. Yeah, right? me neither. But um, I find that the Cody Jinx has a little bit of that, whereas. Chris Stapleton for me was yeah big country music uh, during the uh, during last year as well. Those albums made the best of, and this fucking Coulter Wall is even taking it one step further. It's like Chris Stapleton, you can imagine him in a Ford commercial, or you can imagine him in you know right. for a pickup truck commercial or a fucking Coors commercial and all that stuff, and not in a bad way, right? Because it just sounds like just typical Americana, but. Yep. Coulter Wall sounds like music that you should be listening to by the campfire. I can't yeah. imagine hawking anything to that. It just, it sounds way, way, way too earthy to market. Does that yep. make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's genuine. It's rough around the edges. It doesn't have the polish. I mean, his voice is... Uncanny. Uh, uncanny yeah it's crazy um and yeah you just i don't think he would try to sell you something and i don't think his music like stands for that which is it's refreshing well i had heard look for me there was i had heard about 
Coulter Wall because a lot of the guys at Stoughton are big into the whole alt country thing. So these guys know about the stuff before it ever hits, right? Yeah. And I, I do agree with you with Sturgill, by the way. It's just Sturgill for me was meta modern sound. I went back and I kind of stopped there. You know, but uh, and it's great. I mean, I, I it's think just different. Whatever Sailor's Guide to the Galaxy or whatever. Yes, it's still a, it's a great record. It's just not what I'm looking for when I'm looking for country. Yeah, when you go to Chinese food, you want Chinese food. If you're taking Chinese right. takeout, that's the flavor that you want. So it's just a question of that's not my flavor. If I have to go for that, Coulter Wall hit that, but did more than that because Colt like. A lot of country for me, a lot of what makes country music work right now is it sounds as authentic as all the guys that I used to love, all my country heroes, the Merle Haggards and, you know, all the old guys. Yep. Um, Coulter Wall extends the language. To me, that just, it, it extends the language and it's just... Uh, I'm convinced he's from Canada on top of that, which really freaked me out. That was ha I was happy to see that. And, you know, there's big, like, big pictures of the planes and everything. So he's not just Canadian. I, he He's proudly Canadian. When yeah. I was listening to that record, dude, Songs of the Plains, the only thing that came to mind was this guy is going to be huge in Canada at some point, like huge. Oh, hell yeah. Like stadiums type of thing. And, Not stadiums. I, mean, I for think it's, arenas, I think it's so interesting, right, that his, his voice, he's got that sound that is the, like a classic country sound. But as a 20, what is he, 23 or 24 years old? Yeah, he's a kid. As a young man, he's also has a songwriting craft that is like, it's both really country but really human, right? That Songs of the Plains is all about how the places we grow up shape who we become and like there's nothing more universal than that and like that's that's like such a uh wise and very country kind of theme and like good for him for like knowing that he's got a certain type of sound but he's also just seems like that type of dude well you know it's funny because i mean if if you think of, I mean, for me, look, I mean, if I had to think of country music, automatically what I think of is Americana. Okay, so to mm -hmm. me, it's just it's the sound of, it's the sound of white America. Okay, uh, and when it's captured well, I really love it. But the thing is, the cult, like Coulter Wall, has that. But the thing is, with country, it's so easy to start just playing into oh you know the whole the old stereotype of oh well my dog left me and my wife left me and all i got is this bo bottle and this shotgun it's so easy to go into that especially when you're talking about new country trying to sound authentic again trying to sound mm -hmm. like the stuff that came before it right coulter wall doesn't depend on that at all as a matter of fact if you listen to the songs this guy's not trying to look like he's from colorado or he's from montana He's from Saskatchewan, nope. man. He says it right there. And in the songs, when he's talking about the city slicker, he's not talking about the city slicker the way all, the way I've heard Haggard, uh, Haggard do it type of thing. He's talking about a city slicker from Toronto. <laughs> and as a Canadian dude, that really speaks to me a lot. And it makes me think of um, Tragically Hip, and what it is that made them as huge as they were, even at the beginning. They just came from this little town in Ontario. You know, they were just yeah. good boys made good who just played in clubs and eventually played arenas. And it was a local thing. And eventually the world wound up finding out about it. And I get the feeling with Coulter Wall, man, that he might be at the beginning of that. I certainly hope it for him. I hope so, too. I really do. I think he's a guy who deserves it. He's got genuine talent and he seems like a genuine guy. Always hard to say when you, you know, whatever. I've never met the guy, so who knows, but it seems like that. Okay, so um, if you had to suggest one record, just one. One thing that I've liked that you guys have done with Vinyl Me Please is that um, it's available to non-members. That's really been a very cool thing to see. So, you know, there's there, there's a... Uh, the exclusivity for members is cool because it gives them a window to get at it first. I think that's great. 
But the fact that it's open to non-members, I think, is really great too, because these records should be available. I mean, and you know, I can point, I can point to the Impulse and Blue Note catalogs again. I know that non-members who will not join subscription clubs want those records. You know, um, what record would you suggest? Let's say, uh, forget vinyl, me please. Forget trying to sell a subscription. Just what record would you suggest and say? You know what? We did this one really well. This one's fantastic. It represents who we are. We're happy. It's a lot of lot of eggs to put in one basket. Um, I mean, the Aiello that we always already spoke to, I think is is one that we're super proud of. I, I think. Mitski and like being out in front of that I think a lot of people you know whatever it's on all these if you you are an indie rock person mm -hmm. it's in the top 10 of everybody's 2018 list and and honestly it's it's where we stick our neck out the most right like I think you could argue oh well Ayelu you know it was more challenging musically the way Ethiopian singers sing is it's a little bit jarring to like our Western sensibilities. All Very of that. unique. Um, yeah. So, so you could say Aiello is a bigger risk, but in a lot of ways, like Mitski, like for us to, we, we were hearing that record in March, right. And deciding if we wanted to release it in April or pardon me, in August when it actually came out. Mm. So there's no other reviews. We're listening to it in a vacuum. And, and we said, if we're going to do one new release this year, like, that's one we would put a bet on. Now, I'm not saying it's a record for everybody. Um, if I had to, you know, it, it's so hard to say, like, what am I most proud of? I, I'm really proud that we we took a risk on Mitski. I think it's it's the right record for 2018. I think it captures a lot of what's happening. Um, but, I, I mean, I could say the Silver Tones. I love that we took a swing at the Trojan catalog and didn't do something obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, we did that as July's record of the month and really dug deep in the Trojan catalog. We got to work with the folks at Trojan celebrating their 30th anniversary. We got to go down and film a mini documentary with the band and, and hear their stories. It's a pretty interesting, you know, compelling story about how they, like – the process of writing music in Jamaica was a lot of like free form, like vocal riffing, like where these guys were standing on street corners, street corners and sure. writing, writing songs. Uh, it was a great look at like an ability to tell a story and a way to surface a record that maybe wasn't on a lot of people's record uh, uh, radars. Uh, and in general, I mean, I, I appreciate that you're giving me a forum to to look back at this year. I mean, I'm just really proud of that diversity, right? To have done things like Snoop Dogg's Dog Pound and Arctic Monkeys and stuff that's like, you know, pretty well known, but to also push some boundaries and do an Aiello Mez Mezfin, to do a Towns Van Zant oh, yeah. 50th anniversary of For the Sake of the Song, I think the breadth of the records that we had this year, both as subscription and store titles really shows who we are and who we want to be and the community that we want to serve is just to say like genres don't matter. Like good music is good. Yes. And we're going to try to like put it out in the world in a way that gives a listener like the best experience that that's possible at, $29 a month or $27 a month or whatever. Well, look, one thing that became clear to me is why, you know, uh, it costs $29 a month. The entire package, and of course, you know, I'm going to be talking about it a lot in the new year, but issues of quality control are issues after really testing. I, I, I did this entire project with quality control um, and tested 250 new records over the span of three months. And including a ton of VMP stuff. So it was really cool to just come up to my own conclusion with my own physical artifact and say, you know what, this wasn't perfect, but but the standard is consistently higher all the way across. The packaging is consistently higher. 
everything seems to have all of those little things that make it worth $29. It goes back to exactly what I was saying before. You're not at the $20 level where you get some records where I don't buy them anymore because they're too cheap. They're too cheaply made and you don't exist at the $50 or $40 level where I don't buy Mondo for that reason. You know, it's just, it's, it's not what I do. I just want a, something qualitative. I want something quality. You know, I want to enjoy a good steak to use the example. I want to enjoy a good steak without necessarily having to go fucking to a steakhouse and pay $12 for a potato and $55. You, you know what I mean? And there's yeah. that place. There's that place. There's that steakhouse that exists in every place where, you know, for 25 bucks, you're going to get a steak with the trimmings and you're going to come out happy. Vinyl Me Please became that place. And for me, I'm a cafe guy. I'm a diner guy. I'm a steak at those cheap places guy. So, and, and that's not to cheapen what you're doing. What I'm saying is that you're offering, yeah. you're offering quality at a price that makes sense. Makes sense. Well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. I, you know, when I get these chances to talk to you and, and talk about what we're doing as finally, please, it's like with the, the greatest level of humility. I mean, we're all here because of the music and it is a absolute privilege to get to, you know, try to distribute that music to, to other people that are awesome fans and know way more about music than than i ever will and and to you know get to do that is is a thing that i'm i'm extremely fortunate and and uh thankful to get to do i'm happy to share these stories with the vinyl junkies audience thank you for putting this together for everybody who bought records from us this year thank you like genuinely and and i hope 2019 you know, these projects keep getting better and bigger and that we all find new stories and new records to fall in love with. Um, you know, we've been speaking over an hour and I got to say it's a personal pride, pride thing for me, but we spoke for nearly an hour and Queen and Night in the Opera may have not come up a single time. The fact that we've managed to stay away from the most obvious picks of the is... Uh, it speaks volumes for what it is that you're doing. Honestly, I, when I met you in Detroit and I had a chance to say it to Cameron as well, and I had a chance to say it to all of you, man, it's just thanks. You know, you're, you're, you're doing right by it. Matt Fiddler's doing right by it. It's, uh, and one thing that, that makes me happy is, you know, I would say that I'm not satisfied with the quality of a lot of stuff that comes out. I'm disappointed and I want to see that go up. But, um, you know, when you see the quality there, you got to just say the quality is there. And dude, man, solidly, I looked at about 50 of your records. You make good records. You make records that sound good and you make records that just feel good. The experience is there. You have it. That's awesome. And it's awesome. I mean, we, we hope so, but it's, yeah, you know, you, you can win. never look at your own stuff objectively. So I, I truly appreciate that. Well, it's the reason it is that I can champion it. And I'm proud of the relationship that we have because, um, vinyl junkies for me is exactly about that. You know, I do listen to the record and I don't talk about the music. I talk about the physical aspect of it. So I'm talking about the actual product. So when I, I see a lot of product come in, when I see your product come in all the time and just time after time, it's good. It makes it very easy for me to say, you know what? It doesn't, you, you can find it too expensive, but sure. this is the price. And this is the offering. It makes it so fucking clear when you know what the standard is. It's easier to say, oh, no, it's like there's there's no mystery for the general. That there's there's just a standard that goes a little bit above, which tells you why you're getting what you're getting. So, I mean, thanks for doing that. I think that uh, just in industry in general, it's a uh, it's a stability that me as a consumer am happy to have to deal with. I'm glad that you're doing it for us. Well, we will uh, we will keep trying to raise that bar, and you know I can't wait to 
get cracking on some of the stuff we've got in the pipe for 2019. Yeah, I think some people are going to be pretty damn excited. Well, look, man, you enjoy your holidays. This was fun. It's crazy how fast the time flies when you and me talk. I look forward Absolutely. to doing more of these next year, buddy. Absolutely. Me too. Happy holidays to you. Happy holidays to everybody in the Vinyl Junkies community. I hope everybody's playing records and spending time with friends and family and sharing music. Happy holidays, everybody. Cheers, man.